start the show. <laughs> start it. Hey, weirdos. I'm Elena. I'm Ash. And this is more. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you said it. <laughs> I did. I was gonna also say, and this is morbid. I was just blinking really weird at her before, and then she said, "Start the show." Start the show. <laughs> Start it. And I couldn't. It made me think of Sutton when she says, "Name them." Name them. <laughs> Start the show. Start it. Start it. <laughs> Name them. Name them. <laughs> Name them. Oh man. Name them. <laughs> We're Sorry. in a place of Wiley today. <laughs> yeah. I just had a little DC. I got my little caffeine from a DC Diet Coke. Didn't know what that was for a second. I know. I'm not going to lie. I know. I saw you looking around the room like, what did she recently have? <laughs> I was like, what did she have that I didn't know about? And I had a little perfect bar. They make mini ones now. So it gave me a little sugar from the chocolate. A little shug shug. A little shug. And I feel cuckoo. You, you feel and seem cuckoo. I feel Giovanni, actually. <laughs> How do you feel? Really? You're in a place of real housewives at all times. Yeah. <laughs> Just Just we not establish that every day on my left that I wake Just up? Just got to point it out. Yeah. I mean, please, please never don't. I, I never won't. Never won. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I never won't. You don't have to worry. It's a little bit of a later in the day recording, so. Yeah. You know, those can get a little wily. Yeah. We won't get wily once we get into this because no. whoa, but. We won't. Trust me. But we figured we'd just start you off with how wily we are. Yeah. Been through a lot of different subjects today. Yeah. Hit a lot of different things. Yeah. You know? Today's been a silly kind of, really. <laughs> <laughs> really, Mikey? Your fucking good tone with which you just said that. Really? Really? Really, David? Keep, keep it in. Keep, keep it, it in. in. Mention, Mention it all. Mention it all. Another Real People Housewives are like, quote. are you guys all right? We are not. No. I don't really think there's a way to transition into this. I'm just going to go for we're, it. Yeah, we're never going to get there. No, we just got to get there. So rip the band-aid today, off. Today, as you can tell from the title, we're going to be talking about the mysterious death of Charles Morgan. This is a twisty turny case. I love a twisty turny case. It's very twisty turny. It is unsolved. Oh. And I am not going to tell you what I think, and you're not going to say what you think, because you'll see. Oh. Okay. So okay. you guys can figure out whatever you think, but I don't have figure any thoughts. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sharing my thoughts. I'm just telling you the case. Oh. Okay? Okay. Okay. So in March of 1977, Arizona businessman Charles Morgan, he went missing from his home in Tucson, Arizona, only to turn up three days later in the middle of the night, shoeless, traumatized, and with broken plastic handcuffs over his wrists and ankles. Completely unable to speak, he wrote that he had been drugged by an unnamed individual, kidnapped, but refused to tell his wife more than that and refused to let her call the police or otherwise report the assault. Okay. Three months later, Charles Morgan's body was discovered in the desert with a gunshot wound to the back of his head, one of his teeth wrapped up in a handkerchief, and a $2 bill pinned to his underwear. I have heard of this. Have you? It was the $2 bill to the underwear that made me think it. Yep. I'm yeah, I don't know all the know details. No, I don't know all the details. I know that part. Okay, okay. And I think that's as far as I know. But, oh. Yeah, I want to just start you off by, like, really bringing you in. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Right at the top, we're going to get into some other stuff. The but tooth and the handkerchief. The tooth and the handkerchief. So, the thing was, from the outside, Charles Morgan appeared to live a very normal and for lack of a better word, unexciting life. But when investigators started digging into his background to find out who would have wanted him dead, they discovered a very complicated and very bizarre story of supposed government agents, mobsters, and really a mystery just straight out of a movie. Wow. But now we're going to go a little bit backwards. Let's go backwards. So let's do that. Let's go. Charles Chuck Curtis Morgan. He was born March 16th, 1938 in Everett, Washington. He was the oldest of two children born to Leonard and Doris Morgan, and he was raised in Tucson, Arizona, so pretty much lived there his whole life. Yeah. In 1958, he married a woman named Ruth, and they had four daughters, Megan, Erin, Heather, and Colleen. Friends describe Chuck as, quote, quiet and dedicated to his work, family, and Masonic Lodge life. 
uh, described by his colleagues as an escrow genius. Which like wow, like you're you're awesome. That feels niche. An escrow genius. It is a little niche. He took a job with the country escrow service, where he worked as an agent, managing accounts and working on behalf of clients to mitigate risk, offer financial advice, execute transactions quickly and smoothly. The whole nine. This was the first of his two stints with the county escrow service. And outside of work, he continued exploring his interests in real estate finance and quote dabbled in personal real estate deals. Okay. So he's kind of like, he, he's got like a money mind. Yeah. He understands money. Money mind. And although he was considered to be a true profession, professional by... A true and, professional. A true professional. And by most accounts, really easy to get along with. Like most people liked him. In February of 1977, he did get into a rather uh, heated argument with his supervisor at Western Tile Insurance, or Title Insurance, excuse me. And that resulted in his being fired for insubordination. Oh. Which seemed really abrupt. Yeah. But after his departure from Western Title Insurance, he ended up borrowing $30,000 from a Tucson-based lender in order to purchase a controlling interest in statewide escrow service with plans to build up the company. Okay. But in order to secure the loan, Chuck took out a third mortgage on his home to use as collateral, hoping that the risk would pay off once the business started growing. Yeah. But the Arizona State Banking Department flagged the transaction as suspicious, and they put a hold on the transfer, which ultimately delayed the sale by more than three months. Ooh. And this was for a reason. Uh-oh. But – For people who didn't know that, the state's hold on the transfer of shares seemed pretty odd because for people who knew Chuck, they were like, he's done stuff like this before. Like, he's an escrow genius. Yeah. He's not like a suspect kind of guy or anything. Why are they putting – why are they so sus of this transaction? Yeah. But what was equally confusing was what – was was was, was was that the delay was followed by warnings and threats from the state baking department to deny Chuck a license to operate statewide escrow. Huh. So now they're not only delaying the transaction itself, like the the loan, but they're saying we're not even going to let you operate statewide escrow. What's going on? However, by early May, it became clear that the state's interference with the transaction and the operation of statewide was an attempt to force Chuck Morgan's cooperation with their investigation into the lender that he was going through, Banco International. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. On May 4th, 1977, he was actually subpoenaed by the district attorney to testify against three Banco officials the following week. Whoa. And after this his escalated very quickly. Didn't it? And after his testimony, they released their hold on the statewide share transfer and the sale was approved. So okay. it was very clear that the whole yeah. reason they had done this was like, we're not going to let you have this until you testify. He did, and he got And they were like, the cool. Now, the case involved what amounted to insider trading and other acts of fraud committed by at least three Banco officials with whom Chuck Morgan had close relationships. Yeah. And following his secret testimony provided in May, Chuck told several individuals, quote, that he feared for his life. Damn. Which, like, insider trading is pretty fucking scary. Yeah. That shit can get really, really wild. It gets super wily. Oof. I don't no, want to know. Not worth it, my friends. I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to know anything about anything. You trading inside? I don't know anything. Keep me out of it. Trading inside? I don't even know outside. Don't I don't even, know Don't any even of do it. that. Don't just, shh. Don't worry about me. <sighs> I, don't I don't know. Shh. I don't know. Hush. But however, when state officials offered physical protection for Chuck and his family, Chuck declined the protection and rarely spoke of the matter again. Huh. Now, it's interesting that That's he would weird. decline the offer of protection. Because yeah. Because now we're going to go back a little bit here. Sorry, we're kind of doing like forward, backward, forward, backward. But we're going backward here before he testified. Okay. On the morning of March 22nd, 1977... Chuck said goodbye to his wife, Ruth, and left the house to drive their daughters to school, just like he did every other morning. No one knew it at the time, but the state banking department was breathing down his neck, pressuring him to testify in this Banco case. It turned out that the case against Banco was only one of the secrets that Chuck was keeping at the time. Uh-oh. Journalist Don Devereaux told producers from Unsolved Mysteries in 1990. Exactly. That's the one. Yeah. So Don Devereaux told them he was around the edges of a couple very large organized crime groups in Arizona at the time. It was very easy to get in over your head. He was doing perhaps upwards of a billion dollars of escrow work in bouillon and platinum. These were transactions that only existed on paper. 
He was a straight businessman that probably got a little too close to the flame. He flew too close to the sun. Yeah, and that's not good. So basically he's saying he's involved in shady Sopranos type shit. Yeah, that's like high level shady stuff. Oh, you just wait. It gets higher level. Like I can see why he was scared. Yeah, absolutely. Immediately. Because he's like, I know what I've dipped into. Right. Allegedly. Perhaps. Yeah, allegedly, he was like, I'm a little worried about yeah. po- what I allegedly possibly dipped myself into. Exactly. Allegedly. Perfect way to you say know? that. I think that was very smooth. I think that was great. Yeah. Not clunky at all. Nope, at all. <laughs> so when Chuck failed to return home that evening, his wife Ruth obviously became worried, and she continued to worry as one day turned into two and there was still no sign of Chuck. But finally, on March 25th, three days after he'd left the house, Ruth was awoken by a loud thump at the back door in the middle of the night. And she remembered she was laying in bed and the dog started barking. Chuck had come home. But it wasn't that simple. Ruth was obviously super relieved that Chuck was home now, but once she took a look at him, her relief slowly started to fade away. She said, I got up, went to the door, and opened it, and there was Chuck. He was missing a shoe and had one plastic handcuff around one ankle and a set around his hands. When he motioned to his throat and didn't say a word, I asked him, can you talk? Can you write? He shook his head yes, that he could write. So I went and got a tablet and a pen. He wrote that his throat had been painted with a hallucinogenic drug and that the drug could drive him irrevocably insane or destroy his nervous system and kill him. I wanted to call a doctor and the police, but he was adamant that that would be signing a death warrant for the entire family. His throat had been painted? With a hallucinogenic drug. With a hallucinogenic drug drug that that could could drive drive him him. insane. Yup. Or or just like blow up his nervous system. And he's like, don't get a doctor. Nope. We're just going to wait this one out. We're just going to see what happens here. And Ruth obviously like wanted to call a doctor, wanted to call the but police. But then she's scared. What does that mean? But he's, he's sitting there saying, like, if you do that, our whole family is going to die. So she's like, okay, I guess I won't. But like, what the fuck? I hate this. Yeah. How do you paint someone's throat? I don't really want to know, personally. That was my first question. Yeah, that was mine, too. And then I said, don't ask yourself that. I gotta stop asking questions. You should, for sure. But I still have that question. Uh, Yeah, I think against their will is the best answer. Oh my goodness, I'm upset. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like this at all. But according to Chuck, he'd been kidnapped, and the kidnappers had tortured him before administering this mysterious drug. But he refused to elaborate on who they were, quote-unquote. Ruth insisted that they needed to go to a hospital at the very least, uh, very least, and report the assault to the police. But Chuck was like, nope, that will put me, you, and all four of our daughters at serious risk for further harm. So Ruth was like, okay, like, I yeah. guess I won't do that. And she well, just nursed him that? back to health at home. Holy And he shit. ended up recovering. Now, a short time later, once his voice had started to come back, which, like, his voice took a little while to come back, Ruth said. And you wonder if it really was what he said him, yeah. what they had told him it was you know what i mean or if it was a scare tactic yeah and they did something else that you know fucked him up for a little while it was just like made you lose your voice who knows so like what does that i just i don't know what this is upsetting it's so upsetting but once his voice had started to come back he claimed that his captors um he had escaped them near phoenix's sky harbor airport but he would not go any further than that he just said he got away from them okay. but he would make vague allusions to being Uh, to his being some sort of a secret agent for the U.S. government. Mm. Later, Ruth would tell Unsolved Mysteries, he wrote, they took my treasury identification. That was the first I'd heard of it. Then he told me he'd been working for them for about two or three years, and that was it. But the only other bit of information that Chuck imparted to his wife was that, quote, a $2 bill he always kept with him was temporarily taken in the kidnapping. And remember, huh. yeah. I said when Chuck is eventually found dead, a $2 bill is attached to his underwear. What the fuck? And he said to her this they first time that he was kidnapped and uh, uh, allegedly escaped his kidnappers and came home that they temporarily took it. And why did he say the word temporarily? Like they're going to give it back to me? Right. Like you're going to like meet knew? up with these people again somehow? Or like or you're going to try and go get it back? Sounds to me like they made it seem like they were going to see him again and give him that. That's what it sounds like. Like maybe it was, and this is me totally speculating because obviously I have no fucking clue what's going on. No. That perhaps they told him like he had to do something 
And in once order he to does get it, back, it, he gets that back. His two dollar bill and maybe yeah, his like and like something else. Yeah. Like those are being held as collateral for something else, and maybe he didn't. He wasn't able to do the thing. I think that's a pretty. He good, was told to do pretty good uh, speculation. I hate this. It's crazy. This is very upsetting. It's crazy. I know I keep saying that, but it is. It's upsetting me. No, it's crazy. I, I just keep saying it's I crazy. I feel bad for this family. Like wow. I feel so bad for this family because they never got answers. Yeah. Ever. Oh, that's awful. But what Chuck didn't tell his wife, but later told his friend and employee Jeff Tuberville, was that his kidnappers had stolen several platinum, excuse me, seven platinum bars from the trunk of his car worth approximately $50,000. He know. just had those in his car? I literally wrote, you know, the kind that everybody has laying around in yeah. their trunk. Like what? This was the first of multiple strange and unusual statements that Chuck made to family and friends after this alleged kidnapping. In the weeks that followed, Chuck, who always has like was completely clean shaven and kept his hair tidy and short, started growing his hair out and letting his beard grow. And he also started telling his wife and his close friends that he quote had damaging, potentially embarrassing information on prominent uh, Tucsonans, and that uh, area po- uh, politicians involving escrow and land deals and laundering money. He had all that kind of information. Oh, no. on people. Most of the time, those vague illusions made no sense to anybody around him. Like the time he told Jeff Tuberville that an unnamed employer of his was, quote, somehow messed up in the mafia and had threatened his family. But there wasn't any direct evidence of anybody having threatened him. But still, Chuck became hyper vigilant and paranoid about his safety. He started carrying around a gun on him at all times and always had at least one gun in the car. He also started wearing a bulletproof vest everywhere he went. What the fuck? And refused to let his daughters leave the house unescorted and never allowed strangers in the house or near the children. I mean. Which, like, I yeah, can't say I blame him. I don't blame him at all. After that? But despite the lack of evidence and the fact that one doesn't immediately think of Tucson, Arizona in regards to organized crime, Chuck's vague statements about the mafia and the land fraud are at least somewhat rooted in history, actually. Huh. In the early 1960s, New York City crime boss Joe Bonanno moved to uh, the Phoenix area, and he remained somewhat active in organized crime while he was out there. In 1960, Tucson police discovered the body of Arizona real estate promoter Louis Sirota in the trunk of his car, strangled to death with the ropes still around his neck. Holy shit. And his murder was the first of very few gangland-style murders in the Tucson area. But it was suggested that while not totally common to the region, there were some organized crime-related murders in this area. So it wasn't completely out of the frame of the possibility. Realm of possibility kind of thing. Exactly. And in fact, in his 1999 autobiography, Joe Bonanno's son, Bill, claimed, quote, he ran a crew of 25 to 30 men in Arizona that was into gambling and shylocking, but never admitted to any crimes of violence. Damn. So... That's from, I didn't from the know family that, yeah. himself. I didn't know that that was all happening there. I didn't know either. Who, who knew? Who knew? Now, the Bonanno crime ring wasn't the only criminal operation running in Tucson or Phoenix at the time. There was also a number of gangs and small-scale rings running drugs across the border and using Arizona real estate to launder the money. Throughout the 1970s, Arizona actually had laws and regulations that allowed land to be purchased through a blind trust which meant that the actual owner couldn't be traced, making it kind of the perfect arrangement for money laundering. Yeah. And these deals would almost certainly require an escrow agent in the buying process, making that escrow agent a participant, willing or unwilling, depending on the circumstance. Oh, shit. Yeah, and they would be involved in fraud and money laundering. Oh, damn. Which is actually kind of ironic because the entire idea behind having an escrow agent in the first place is... To avoid fraud. If exactly. Something goes wrong with the deal. So it's funny that it's like this is actually showing fraud. Yeah, but you could actually find yourself wrapped up in it. Yeah. Like even completely unwillingly. Yeah. But and then at that point, there's nothing you can yeah, do. Yeah, what can you do? You're involved. Exactly. Damn. Now, it should be noted that there were rumors about uh, Chuck having done escrow work for the Bonanno family and Ned Warren, another known criminal. But investigators didn't make any mention of it in their reports, and there's no direct information in the contemporary contemporary reporting of this, so that's all alleged. Okay. But people do say that. There are rumors. Okay. Now, if Chuck was paranoid after his disappearance in March, he became decidedly more so after testifying in the Banco International case in May. Because remember, the state was breathing down his neck, 
and he agreed to testify. But before the time he testified, that kidnapping took place, uh, that alleged kidnapping. Yeah. Then he testifies in May. And afterwards, he's, like, super freaked out. He continued wearing a bulletproof vest nearly everywhere he went, continued to carry guns on his person and keeping them in the car. And he also had his car equipped with a CB radio and a police scanner that allowed him to monitor all kinds of criminal activity and law enforcement in the area. Damn. Like, just so he always knew what was yeah, going on. Yeah, just knew what was happening. His car had also been fitted with a special lock that unlocked the doors from a release under the front fender of the car. Huh. Yeah. Now, on the afternoon of June 7th, 1977, Chuck went to a work meeting around lunchtime and called his office a little before 1 p.m. to let him know, let the office know that he was on his way back and he'd be there in about a half hour. But he never returned to the office that oh, day shit. or any other. After what happened the first time Chuck disappeared, Ruth this time didn't waste any time reporting this second Good. disappearance to the police. But the problem is that there's no laws preventing an adult from completely abandoning their responsibilities without telling anyone. And there was no evidence of a crime, so there really wasn't anything they could do to go find Chuck. Oh, that must have felt so helpless. Especially with what she woke up to yeah. in the middle of the night, like, a couple months she earlier. She knows what, was, what happened there. Well, she doesn't know what happened there, but she saw the aftermath. Yeah, and she's like... I know that you had said, like, if I, if I reported this, people were going to come after us. Have they come after you anyway? Yeah, and it's like, are they now going to come after us? Yeah, you're probably just imagining, like, like all worst-case scenarios. What do you do in that scenario? I have no idea. But Chuck had been missing for nine days when Ruth rece received a mysterious call at home from an, 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 an anonymous caller. Ruth recalled that this, she said, this woman said, Ruthie? I said, yes. She said, Chuck is all right. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8, and then she hung up, which that's like a verse from the Bible. I was just going to say, is that a Yeah, a Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, 1 Boston. through 8. As far as Ruth knew, that particular passage had no special meaning or relevance to her or Chuck, but one section jumped out at her. The woman said, and this is a quote, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. Then dust will return to earth as it was, and spirit and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Okay. So she just receives this I like I have chill saying this, this weird ass phone call. And she's sitting there trying to pick apart what this message means. This is a nightmare. An absolute nightmare. Now Two days later, around 8 o'clock in the morning, Chuck's body was discovered. Ugh. He was found by two teenagers alongside Arizona Route 86, about 15 miles east of Sells, Arizona. When they arrived at the scene, investigators found Chuck lying about 10 feet away from his car, wow. which had been pulled off the road. His body was face down on the desert floor with a large hole in the back of his head that appeared actually to have been made with his own 357 Magnum which was lying by his left hand. Strangely, his eyeglasses, which he always were, wore, excuse me, were attached to his left wrist, and he was wearing a black belt that concealed a large knife, but there wasn't any evidence that he had tried to, to draw the knife at any point. Huh. Otherwise, there didn't appear to be any struggle at the scene, and there weren't any footprints to be found. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. When officers searched his car, they found that CB radio and the police scanner, as well as, quote, large amount, amounts of ammunition and several weapons. But one of the more dis disturbing discoveries came when technicians found a piece of one of his teeth in the backseat of the car wrapped in a white handkerchief with no idea how it ended up there. What? It's like, it's so, did he have, like, injuries? Like, that he had been in a fight? No. Like somebody had punched him? No. Nope. Because to me, that feels like it's like you get punched and break, break a teeth. Break a teeth. Break a teeth. <laughs> break a tooth and like, I don't, I'm trying to like None wrap my listed, brain around this. None that were listed. Because they. It's like, what the fuck? Or, like, or maybe just broke his tooth. And wrapped it in a white handkerchief and threw it in the backseat of his car. I don't know. That's fucking weird. I mean, this whole thing is weird. I have no idea. I'm trying to find any kind of normalcy in here. There's none. Don't, don't even look. Wow. The the tooth in the back seat of the car is very strange very to me. Strange. The, the piece of the tooth, I should say. But the strange discoveries huh. continued once the scene had been cleared and the body was taken away to be processed. The pathologist determined that Chuck had been dead no more than twelve hours. 
meaning that he had been alive nearly the entire time he'd been missing. So when that person called and said Chuck is fine, they were telling the they truth. They were he was telling still the alive. truth. And now the bullet had entered, quote, the top back of the head and launched in the soft palate behind Chuck's front teeth. Okay. So there's that doesn't explain the tooth in the back seat. That just no. explains where the gun gun uh the bullet lodged. And you wonder, like, because it's like that it doesn't sound like there was any blood spatter in the car to indicate that he was killed in a car. No. And it's like you wonder if there was blood spatter on the ground at the scene. I think I would indicate. assume that there was some kind of blood blood spatter, but because it sounds like a like execution style. Yeah. And that's the thing. And even more strange. There were no fingerprints on the 347 Magnum, but there was gunpowder residue on Chuck's left hand, indicating that he had fired a gun at the the very least very recently, though not necessarily the gun used in his death. Now, this fact struck Ruth as among the strangest elements of the case, because according to her, Chuck was right-handed and she said he could do practically nothing with his left hand. Hmm. Strange. Yeah, like that this gun, this uh, GSR on his hand. Right. And on his left hand? On his left hand. Okay. Indicating that he had fired a gun recently, but maybe not necessarily this one, with his left hand. But his wife is saying, no, he can't do anything with this. And it's like, did they make, did they put their hand around his hand and make him essentially do it Mm -hmm. with their help? And maybe there's no, that's why there was no fingerprints on the gun. But it's like, even st- that's such a strange angle, too, because... Oh, it's such a strange angle. Doesn't make any sense. But it's like, I don't know. Yeah. The top, and that's, well, I guess the top back of his head. So that's not that strange of an angel. It's still angle. a weird angle. It's weird. But if you're... But doable. Oh, you know? I, yeah. I'm it trying is to, doable. we're both just sitting here, like, trying to make it work with... This is... Wow, this is a weird one. It is, and I would lo- I'm, I would love to know like the the analytics of like the the crime scene. Yeah, like the like any blood spatter and like what direction it looked like it was going in. Because it's like, did it look like he was looking this way? Did it spatter that way? Did it right? Because it's like that is an easier way to do it if you turn your head to the side. Yep. Than doing it back there because right. then your angle gets weird. You get kind of like smushed like up. This, your angle is a little more. Yeah. And if somebody was holding your hand to make it look like you did it kind of thing, that's an easier angle to go about it. But Mm -hmm. that's the only reason I could think of that he has GSR on his left hand. Right. Which he doesn't use. Right. And that there's no fingerprints on the gun because maybe they just wiped it down. I guess, yeah. And maybe they wore gloves. Right. Because then the only fingerprints would have been his. Mm Mm-hmm. Which obviously makes sense if the gun is found in his hand. Well, it only gets stranger. Oh, good. So finally, and perhaps strangest of all, the pathologist discovered, like I said at the top of the story, a $2 bill pinned to his underwear. Mm -hmm. It was unclear whether this was the same $2 bill that Chuck kept with him at all times, and he claimed had been taken by his kidnappers in March, but somebody had marked the bill significantly. Hmm. On the front of the bill, there were seven Spanish names, beginning with letters A through G, and above them, the note was Ecclesiastes 12. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that really was someone calling. Absolutely. On the back of the bill, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were each numbered one through seven. And there was a crudely drawn map that led to an area between Tucson and Mexico, quote, to the towns of Robles Junction and Salas City, both known for smuggling. Oh. So it's like, is this some kind of map to say like he was involved in some fucked up shit? Yeah. Like, what is this? Now, the crime scene, if that's what it was even, because at this point they don't know, was deeply strange and mysterious. But as far as anybody could tell, like investigator-wise, there was no evidence of a murder. Even the county pathologist couldn't say whether Chuck's death had been homicide or suicide. So law enforcement uh, officials luckily pursued it as though it could be either. They didn't rule one or the other out. I'm glad. For the Pima County Sheriff's detectives, the mystery surrounding the case was more frustrating than anything else. Yeah. Because on one hand, the incredibly bizarre circumstances surrounding Chuck's disappearance and death suggested a conspiracy, like, right out of a fiction novel. It really did. Or a like, movie. This, this seems like something you would see in the first scene of some, like, wild new crime show. Yeah. You know, a wild new crime movie. And then you go like, back they get and you right figure out it of the all gate out. And you figure out what happened there. And it's like... 
this, how is this real? Right. And all these like weird, strange details. Symbolism and the Bible being involved and stuff. It's like, what's going yeah. on here? The Bible, the signers of the Declaration yeah. of Independence. Like, and they're numbered? They're numbered one like, through seven. Like, what does seven. that mean? I have no idea. And then there's, because all the, the signers are numbered. And then there was also seven Spanish names that were A through G written on the front of the bill. I wonder if so anybody, like, I hope, I'm, I'm assuming someone has like tried to find some kind oh, of pattern here you absolutely. know like but huh. on the other hand the physical evidence strongly supported the theory that chuck's death had been a suicide a strange and elaborately planned one but a suicide they I were mean, like it's possible we could see both sides of this according to one sheriff's deputy morgan could have pulled the revolver's trigger with his thumb even though it would have been awkward and blood and dirt found on the gun could account for its lack of fingerprints okay which like I guess, but like fired it with his thumb. Did we know if did we know if the handwriting on the bill was not his? Like they knew it was not his. I don't know anything about the handwriting yeah. on the bill, actually. So maybe I would assume if it was his, like similar to his, that would be like a that would be kind of like a that would kind of be the thing that it's like okay, he wrote this. Yeah, exactly. But I'm wondering like what who wrote that? Because well, I'm like, like I could buy the because I he seemed like he was in a a big state of paranoia. Yes. Obviously like rightfully rightfully so. so with what he had gone through and he had all this stuff kind of closing in a little bit mm -hmm. so it's like it wouldn't be shocking it would be very tragic but it wouldn't yeah. be wouldn't be like the craziest yeah thing in the like world. you can kind of you could see why that could be the outcome right but like then you look at the that two dollar bill and stuff it's like who and wrote the fact, on that and somebody calling that's the thing the fact that he wasn't the, alone the, that the writing on the two dollar bill correlates with a woman calling yeah. Ruth and referencing the same bible passage and that's the thing it's like so we know he wasn't just like out there you know going through it and then ending it this way it's right. like he was obviously he could have been going through it but obviously he was with other people like obviously somebody knew where he was to call and do that exactly so it's like I, this is just a really, con this is a wild one. It's a strange one. And the suicide theory held no weight with Ruth or any of Chuck's close friends and associates. They all insisted he was, quote, just not the kind of person who would kill himself. Of course, we know that yeah. people don't usually believe their loved one would take their own life. Uh, but in this case, the evidence was not that of a man on the verge of ending his own life, at least to how Ruth and and the close people to him saw it. Yeah, and I mean, they're the ones who know him. Yeah. So. And family friend Ronald Newman told reporters he had everything going for him. He was a family man and real active in the lodge. He had just acquired a new business, which he had been trying to do for a long time. He had finalized one of his goals. Yeah. I and mean, just driving that point home even further, in the months between his disappearance in March and his death in June— Chuck definitely seemed very deeply concerned for his own safety to the point that he never went anywhere without being heavily armed. So they're saying, why would he go so hard on this safety to protect thing himself. to protect himself only to end it? Yeah. Which I I could see people saying, well, like, maybe that just got to be too much and he couldn't handle for it sure. anymore. And if anybody was going to end his life, it was going to be him. Like, you could make that argument. Yeah. But he was going so hard. And why... Why go for such a strange angle yeah. to do it? Like, that, I can't get over that. Like, they're saying, like, oh, he could have done it with his thumb. Why, though? Why? Why would he do that? Right. Like, why would he do, why would he do that? What would the point be? Like, this is an awful thing to think about, but it's like, why would he not just do the, you know, unfortunately, like, a lot of times, like, the gun in the mouth. Like or, that's, yeah, or the side of the temple, even. Or in the, you know what I mean? Like, as awful as that is to think about, why would you pretzel yourself like that and make it difficult and do it with your left hand and randomly out in the middle of the and beforehand pin a two dollar bill to your yeah. underwear with strange writing all and over when you it. look at the writing because you can find a, a picture mm -hmm. of the dollar of the two dollar bills so you can see the writing if you look it up um it's it's clear that person tried to disguise their writing because mm -hmm. they write all in capital letters right so and that's an easier way to disguise. So it makes sense. It feels like somebody trying to disguise their writing. Right. Which there's so many strange little Yeah, none of this is making sense. I don't right now to me it just doesn't feel like it makes much uh, the most sense as a suicide. Mhm. Mm but 
I don't know. There's just a lot of bizarre details. There's a lot of bizarre details. Like, and this is so sad. Yeah, I mean, he had four daughters and That's a wife the thing. that loved and, like, him. This and his family no, obviously had no idea what was going on. And they have no answers. And you don't even know what he knew what was going on. It's like, what the hell's going on here? And then, like we said beforehand, like, is Ruth just spending the rest of her life thinking people are going to come after That's her and her thing. kids at this like, point, you know? Yeah. But the first lead in the case came just a couple days after the body was discovered, and it only made things even fucking weirder. When Pima County Sheriff's detectives received a call from a woman who called herself Green Eyes, that's when the first lead came in. According to the caller, Green Eyes, she was the person Chuck had gone to meet on the afternoon that he went missing, and she was the one who called Ruth and gave her that Bible passage. Green Eyes told the detectives that Chuck had met her at the motel, where he showed her a briefcase containing thousands of dollars in cash, telling her, quote, that the money would buy him out of a contract the mob had put on his life. Huh. Now, the story Green Eyes told detectives was for sure very unusual and would likely have been considered a prank caller grouped in with tips from unreliable callers, except that Green Eyes seemed to know quite a lot about Chuck's whereabouts and his personal life. To the point that Chief Deputy Sheriff Clarence Dupnik believed her to be credible. Mm. He told reporters, this proves that Morgan was not really missing. And that's because Green Eyes explained that she had met Chuck about a month before his death, and she had, quote, been seeing him socially from time to time. She said she'd seen him at least four times in the time since he had been missing from his home, and she had visited him at the Easy 8 Motel, which is where he showed her that briefcase of cash. So investigators followed up on the information that they'd been giving, given, and they confirmed that he had been staying at the Easy 8 Motel the whole time he was missing. What? And that briefcase that supposedly contained thousands of dollars was discovered in his car, but when they discovered it, quote, it only contained business cards. So all the cash was gone, if what there had the been fuck? any in the first place. The call from Green Eyes gained further credibility when the sheriff received a call from a man who referred to himself as the husband of Green Eyes. And this man told him, quote, Morgan and his associates were involved in buying gold bars and gold coins in Mexico. The man wouldn't wouldn't answer any more questions from the sheriff. And unfortunately, investigators were never able to identify either caller. What? But they had all this weird information that was then, some of it at least, validated. What do you mean? They were never able to, come on. Because it was the 70s, I guess. They didn't. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I'm sitting here like, what? (laughs) They couldn't like trace it back. Oh my God. This was 1977 when he went missing. Or excuse me, when he was killed. Bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So to everybody that knew Chuck, the details of his death and the leads coming from anonymous callers seemed wildly off the mark. Yeah. As far as they knew, he was just this mild-mannered escrow agent, dedicated family man, not some kind of like government agent yeah. trading in gold and silver across the Mexican what border. The hell? Like what? But the more and more that investigators dug into Chuck's affairs, the more the tips from callers like Green Eyes seemed potentially legitimate. Wow. Going through his personal papers and records, detectives discovered that he was what they called, quote, a collector, a man who collects uh, collected records and no- notes of every type. Oh. According to investigators, he had been keeping notes and records on prominent people in and around Tucson. Oh. Quote, as well as very detailed notes on his alleged gold and land deals. Oh. So he was presumably involved in gold dealings. Yeah, because he was keeping record of it. He was keeping record of it. While the purpose of the notes would remain a mystery, they did seem to corroborate what Chuck had told Ruth about his being targeted as a result of what he knew about powerful people. So while the notes about people in and around Tucson and Phoenix didn't seem to be connected to anything in particular, the notes about gold and land deals may have been significant. A few weeks after Chuck's death, investigators got information from the U.S. Customs Service regarding an investigation that they had launched in 1973. Mm. According to their report, customs officials had received a tip that Chuck himself and two associates had been involved in what they called a scam to sell non-existent gold. Also, according to that customs report, investigators weren't able to find enough evidence to secure a federal indictment, and the U.S. Attorney's Office decided not to pursue a case. What the fuck? Which makes you wonder, like, was somebody involved in this? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, what's going on here? Now, 
This is interesting to me. Investigators thought it seemed unlikely that this was connected to Chuck's death. Which I'm like, I uh, actually feel as though it's very related to his um, death. If I'm going to have to disagree with these people here. If it was a murder, then... Wouldn't that be a perfect motive? He has all this information. He's involved in shady dealings and people are pissed off about it. Like, I think that actually sounds I feel like, like the that's, very beginning of a murder. That's the motive. Exactly. What? So they felt like it was unlikely that it was connected. Yeah. But at why? the very least, it was a possible explanation, they felt, for the voluminous records, telegrams, voluminous notes, records. and figures about buying and selling millions of ounces of almost pure gold what that Chuck fuck? had been exchanging with people as far as Mexico, Switzerland, and England. Damn, that's deep. Like... You don't think that's connected? Like, that's deep. <laughs> that, that, that is rolling Switzerland? very deep, my friend. Right? Yeah. So by the end of the month, the Pima County Sheriff's Office was starting to put together a timeline of Chuck's movements from when he disappeared, quote-unquote, on June 7th to when his body was found. Ruth Morgan had described her husband as missing for this period of time, but Green Eyes had referred to it as Chuck being in hiding. But from what investigators could tell, while he may have been staying in a motel, he didn't exactly appear to be hiding. He registered at the motel under his own name. And several people reported seeing him as he, quote, conducted routine business in the city in a normal fashion. Huh. So he's just not going home and calling his wife during this period of time. Which is strange because people know him as a dedicated family man. Yeah. But he had supposedly was checked into this motel under his own name, and people said that they saw him in the city, which we know eyewitness, eyewitness accounts, accounts are not. can be... So that makes me wonder, was was that Chuck who was checked in? Yeah. Or is that somebody checked in as Chuck, trying to make it seem like Chuck is in a motel this whole time? Yeah. It's like, no, he's around, he's fine. Huh. But then at the this same time... This gets weirder and weirder. Uh, it, and it will only continue to. But then at the same time, was it Chuck that was registered at that motel? Because remember, yeah. when he was found, he'd been missing all this time, but they presumed that he was only dead about 12 hours when they found him. Yeah, that's true. So, so it's like, it where him? was he before that if he wasn't there? Right. He, and he was... So like, it does make sense. Maybe he was let, at the like, motel. Possibly that that was him. Yeah. Because, it, like, you again... Where where would he be? Yeah. If he wasn't. Like, where was he all that time if he wasn't in the place where he's registered at? And even stranger, the same appeared to be true for his disappearance in March when he claimed that he had been kidnapped and drugged. According to investigators, quote, the day after the abduction was alleged to have taken place, he was seen in Tucson when he was supposed to be in Phoenix. So it didn't look huh. like he had gone into complete hiding. It appeared that for some reason or another... He was hiding from his family and his friends. I wish I could put these pieces together in any way. The only thing that I can think of is why he's staying away from his family and his friends is because he feels like his status as a target has heightened and he doesn't want them wrapped up in it. That's honestly the only thing I can think of, too. Right. Was was like, you know, going with that you know, dedicated father and dedicated husband right. and, like, family man, he's trying to keep it away from the people that he cares about the most. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I can think of. But then he returns home in the middle of all that. But maybe he thinks he... Shit has, like, died down a little bit. Because it's, like, whatever that, like, $2 bill thing was, or, like, maybe he was supposed to do something, and they were like, you know, we'll leave you alone or whatever. Do this and you'll get it back. And it's, like, so maybe he had to go back to start that process of whatever it is they were having him do or wanted him to do. Yep. And maybe that's the only reason he went back, because he thought he was going to end up helping his maybe. family in the long run by, like, getting this taken care of, whatever this is. And remember, if if he did think that he was taking care of it, maybe that explains the briefcase full of cash exactly. that he thought was going to get him out of this alleged like, hit on Yeah, his like, life. maybe this was supposed to be, like, you get this, we do this. You'll get all your shit back at the end of it. Like, we're holding it for collateral. Right. So he goes away from his family and everything to try to keep them out of it. But then he comes back to try to do whatever it is he needs to do. Goes back. Mm -hmm. Or doesn't do it in time. But it sounds more like he just went back to finish off the deal. Right. Because he had that. if, if, If he had that briefcase full of money. Right. 
and was at that motel. Maybe it's like he was there because he was told to go there. Yep. Like maybe that was part of the thing. Like you go to this hotel, you check in. Mm-hmm. I want you to have a briefcase full of this much money in this denomination kind of thing. You know, yep. like when yep. you see in the movies. Yep. And it was like, and then we will meet you here. You will meet us here with that briefcase. With that money. And then we will send you on your way. Right. And maybe that's what he thought was going to happen. Maybe. And maybe they did everything. They took that money from him because, and they, they killed him it. in the end. Yeah. Whoever it is. Maybe. And then it's like the $2 bill of it all is so weird because they're keeping a $2 bill for collateral. Well, and it's like in the writing on it. Right. What the fuck does that mean? And the fact that Green Eyes said she's the one who called Ruth and yeah. alluded to that same Bible passage that's then written on the $2 bill. It doesn't, yeah. But then, like, was like, that's all I'm going to tell you, bye. And it's like, was she scared? Was she trying to, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is. Bonkers. This is just such a weird one. It really is. So, and the problem with all these fantastical leads, if you can even really call them that, coming into the sheriff's office was, while they were certainly interesting and compelling as we're sitting here trying to dissect them, they didn't seem to go anywhere. That's the thing. They would like, chase what do you do down a this? lead and then they'd be like, okay, what what next? Like, yeah. we're stumped. Because even if you're sitting there coming to the the whole like, okay, maybe he was he had to go do something and they right. wanted him to have this money and he they were, he was supposed to meet them somewhere. Who's them? Who's them? You can't you don't even know where to begin. You're yeah. like, who the fuck is them? Yeah. And rumors and stories of him buying and selling gold and silver yeah. bars could have gone a long way to explaining his murder if that's what it was. But they never were anything more than rumors. And similarly, the stories of Chuck having gone into hiding seem to be somewhat exaggerated because it's true he had checked into a motel, but it seemed, at least to the investigators, like if he was trying to hide from somebody, he wasn't trying very hard using his own name and being seen in public. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, it really doesn't feel like that's what it was. So rather than focusing on the majority of, uh, excuse me, focusing the majority of their attention on things they couldn't prove, investigators toward their attention toward the evidence and leads that were more likely to be fruitful. As far as anybody could tell, Chuck's paranoia and his very strange behavior began around March, shortly after he left Western Title and set out to purchase that majority share and statewide escrow service. It was that decision that led him to Banco International, where he had eventually secured a loan. But it was that relationship that led to his being pressured to testify in the state's case against Banco and several of its agents. The testimony in that case was confidential and has actually never been released to the public. But the documents and information that is available to the public indicates that the case was related to several instances of fraud on the part of three members of Banco's board who were trying to buy majority stake in the bank. Okay. And because the case involved Chuck's former employer, Western Title, and because one of the board's members in question was a man who was actually representing Chuck in the purchase of a majority stake in statewide, his testimony was essential in securing the conviction. So that tells you something. Like yeah, Chuck was a, that does. a key witness for this case. So, I mean, that's something right there. And that's going to put you in danger. You have of all these higher ups in these big companies doing yeah. insider trading and fucking I mean, that's all kinds a of shit that I don't understand. Stuff. I was going to say all kinds of shit that I can't even wrap my brain around. Yeah, like I can barely do simple division. But I know it's, I know it doesn't. It probably doesn't bring a lot of great people around you. And I'm not trying to fucks with that. No. But the case was eventually settled out of court and in, in August of 1977. And to investigators, they didn't think that that was related to Chuck's death. Huh. Which is weird because I'm like, come on. It like, sounds really? to me like it could be. It's, I mean, that sounds like, a, again, another perfect motive for someone. Another shady dealing. You know? What is going on here? So the death of Chuck Morgan started out as a case obviously shrouded in mystery and intrigue, but with each passing week, investigators drew closer and closer to what they felt was a more plausible explana- explanation. He had taken his own life. They thought that was way more plausible, which to me, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to say of one way or the plausible. other, but it doesn't seem like but the most me, plausible. It, yeah, that does not seem like the most plausible. When we get thing. to the end, it still won't. By the end of June, there were a number mm-hmm. of fact- factors in the case that were causing sheriff's detectives toward the suicide theory. And these included the location where Chuck had been discovered, the fact that it was very public and, quote, did not indicate that somebody was trying to cover up a murder. 
Okay. Which is like, okay, but then mm. also, is it a show of like, don't fuck with us? Yeah. Like, that, it could very much be that. They might not be trying to cover it up. And so you're saying he decided to end his life in a very public setting? Like, yeah. In a very public area? That's, I don't know. I don't know. They said if Morgan had been killed because of something related to a land deal or money laundering, the killer likely would have rifled through his car or belongings to remove any incriminating evidence, but all of his papers and business documents appeared to be untouched. Which, that's strange. That is strange. And he was known to push himself professionally and had been known to regularly overwork himself, quote, until he had a nervous breakdown and had to take the week off. So they were like, did he just work himself up into a nervous breakdown? I mean, and this possibly, was the end of it. Maybe. And so while those closest to him flatly refused to accept that possibility that he could have taken his own life, others who did know him, not like super close in his circle, but knew him well enough, yeah. they were less certain that he wouldn't have done that. Okay. Several colleagues and friends told reporters that Chuck often struggled with social re- relationships and, quote, was an insecure man who seemed to need the approval of others more than most. According to one friend, Chuck, quote, tended to create a crisis once in a while just so he could solve it. And although Morgan appeared to be a brilliant man, he always seemed to be in financial difficulty. Okay. And others who knew Chuck echoed those sentiments. According to Pat Baldwin, who took over Chuck's position at Statewide after he died, quote, the entire board of directors resigned once they knew he was buying the firm. Whoa. But I'm also like, there were also people that still worked there that were probably involved in some shady shit yeah, that he true. testified against. So were they just worried? So is this all just wrapped up in that, like, that part of it? Right. You know, like, that could be a whole different kind of scenario? Exactly. <sighs> or was it that, like... Yeah. Because also he was known as an escrow genius. So yeah. So you're going to leave? I don't know. I don't know. Because he's involved. Like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But a little over a month into the investigation, no new evidence had been found and all the leads had dried up. So with no evidence to support a murder case and no new tips coming in from the public, the sheriff's department issued a statement on August 10th announcing that based on the evidence and statements collected from those who knew him, Chuck's death was being considered a suicide. Wow. In his statement to the press, the sheriff sergeant Joe Jett said, We have found no evidence that anyone took part in the death but himself. And Jett went on to say that the biggest factors in labeling the death a suicide was one, all the finger and these are all quotes. All the fingerprints and footprints at the scene were Morgan's. There was no sign of a struggle of any kind. Two, the bullet that killed Morgan was fired at very close range from his own 357 Magnum revolver, which lay inches from his body, and large deposits of gunshot residue on his left hand indicate that he held the revolver barrel in that hand when he fired into the top of his head. And three, Morgan was in deep financial trouble at the time of his death. Records indicate that he had cash assets of about $400 and debts of more than $40,000, wow. including a third mortgage on his east side home. Wow. Which, like, that's a lot. Yeah. And this is interesting. So the sheriff's department is like, we're going to go ahead and rule this a, su- a suicide. The county pathologist didn't sh- didn't challenge the sheriff's department conclusion, but they declined to classify the death as a suicide. Huh. And Chuck Morgan's death on paper with the pathologist remains classified as unknown. Interesting. That to me is very, That's very, very interesting. interesting because it's like, if the pathologist isn't willing, then that gives me pause. Yeah. And it's like, is there more just, that maybe wasn't released to the public that's that, the, what po- I'm wondering. that the, the pathologist has access to? That maybe That's just wasn't really reported on. Interesting. Yeah, because when they when a pathologist refuses to to bend to the sheriff that's, or somebody else to, with that, I'm like, big. What's going on? Like, right. what what else is there? What kind of feeling did you have? What did you see? Yeah, initially, what did you think that, you that couldn't, made you question it? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I thought so too. Wow. And the sheriff's decision to label the death as a suicide came as a big surprise to Ruth Morgan, Chuck's wife, and mm. those closest to the family who remain convinced that Chuck was murdered. And I feel really bad for them because it's like... Because then you don't have any answers. To not know. Yeah. Ruth told Unsolved Mysteries in 1990, there's no way Chuck would have committed suicide. And if he had even contemplated suicide, he would have left a letter for his girls and for me. And Which, I can understand her thinking that. Yeah. And I, I mean, obviously, I don't know Chuck from like a hole in the wall, but... yeah. 
wouldn't you like just based off of the descriptions of how much he like he wouldn't even let his children leave the, leave house. the house unprotected. He wouldn't let strangers in the house. Yeah, he wouldn't like, let Ruth go to the police because it was going to endanger the family. Yeah, to me, it seems like and for her to say that for her to say there's no way something wouldn't happen without him leaving communication for me and for his girls. Yeah, that's her saying like, I know him. Right. As a man and as a father and as a husband. And right. I know that he wouldn't have left this world without talking to us with a note. At least giving us like You know, something. just giving us some kind of communication for why. And it doesn't, I don't think, from what she's saying, again, I also don't know Chuck. I don't know this family. But I don't know. It just doesn't seem like he would have wanted to leave all this mystery for his children and yeah. his wife. Yeah. I agree with that. Because that's a lot to grapple with for them to have to wonder. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying, I think, makes the most sense to me, which is he would have left notes for us. I think so, too. Explaining what was going on and what happened. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, journalist Don Devereaux, who I mentioned earlier, he agrees with the family's theory. He said, I've never seen in all my years as a journalist a fellow take himself out in the desert wearing a bulletproof vest and shoot himself in the back of the head. That's true. He's wearing a bulletproof yeah. vest and he shoots himself. That doesn't make That's any sense. Different. And Devereaux cites the statements from Green Eyes yeah. and the man who identified himself as Green Eyes' husband as compelling evidence to support the theory that maybe he was organ uh, maybe he was involved in organized crime and that he was working as an agent of the government, perhaps. That's what he, makes the most sense to me, to be honest. Right? And he elaborated saying, there's a great likelihood that Mr. Morgan was in fact doing something with the government. I think this was a guy who was extremely naive about a lot of things. I think somebody blew his cover and he got killed. Damn. Which, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, all of, and honestly, all of these theories, yeah. you could say that makes sense. Yeah. All of them. Exactly. So. Now, sadly, Ruth Morgan unfortunately passed away oh. after battling cancer in 2006. But according to their children, she remains steadfast in her belief that Chuck was absolutely murdered. Their daughter, Megan, told reporters in 2010, My father had a lot of information about people here in Tucson uh, that could have been very detrimental. There was a lot of information about politicians, people who are still alive that work in our government. He had a lot. He had that information, and they wanted to silence him. That's awful. Which I have chills. Even yeah, just that's reading awful that. to even think about. Now, the 1990 segment of Unsolved Mysteries featuring Chuck's story actually generated a light flurry of interest in the case, and resulted in quote more calls than any other in the show's history up oh, to that man. point. Unsolved Mystery was the way to go, man. Oh, hell you yeah. want to get a case out there? That was the oh, way to go, especially the original one. Oh, so creepy. But among those tips was one from an anonymous source that, quote, pointed to a paid hitman, then living in the Wilkes Bar, Scranton region, who may have traveled briefly to Arizona to carry out a murder contract. Huh. According to this anonymous caller, the hitman supposedly, quote, shot a Tucson businessman in the head in 1977 because he knew too much and then came back to Pennsylvania loaded with money. That's why it's wild to me that they're like, mm, I don't know. This guy, like, it doesn't seem like somebody who would murder someone would leave the scene like this. And I'm like, I don't know. A hitman would. Like, he just goes and does his job. Plenty and then of people would. Leaves. Plenty of people would. Like, they just peace out. Yeah. They're not worried about, like, staging a crime scene here. They're just, they're doing what they were paid to do and then they're out. A job that they've done countless other times, too. Likely, which is, like, yeah. why you didn't so find it's really much, probably. Just, yeah. Now, a second airing of the Unsolved Mysteries episode a few months later generated more calls, some of which were actually routed to the sheriff's department mm. and generated a new potential oh. suspect. According to Sergeant Dave Thomas of the county sheriff's department, investigators interviewed at least one former Wilkes Bar area resident, but are not releasing the suspect's name for legal reasons. Interesting. He noted that the case was never closed and investigators were following up on leads as they received him. But he added that in the absence of any further good witnesses, he said, we probably won't be able to go any further with this. Which, what that, that is that such mean? a, that is such a, like, concrete statement. Like, yeah. I don't think we'll be able to go yeah. any further with this. Nope, probably not. Bye. Huh. I don't know. Now, despite the activity and interest generated by the Unsolved mystery segment, the leads unfortunately went nowhere. And Chuck's case was put back on the shelf. Jeez. But... The case popped up in the news again two years later when 35-year-old Tucson computer technician Doug Johnston, Doug Johnston excuse me, was found dead in his car from a gunshot wound to the head. 
Investigators were unable to find the gun, but without evidence to support a murder theory, the case was labeled a possible suicide, huh. and detectives cited his mounting debt as a possible reason, and the case was closed. Don Devereaux, on the other hand, believes that the death, and this is fucking crazy, was the result of a mistaken hit that had been meant for him. What? According to Devereaux, Johnston drove a car very similar to his own, and the two men looked generally similar similar to one another, resulting in Johnston receiving a bullet meant for Devereaux in order to stop him from further investigating Chuck's story because he was going, like, deep into it, trying to get answers. Uh, Nevertheless, Devereaux hedged, I'm not here to tell you for certain that the bullet Johnston took was meant for me. Nor that there's a known con- that or that there's a known contract out on me for looking into the conspiracy, but I do know that I'm concerned and that they will probably come around again, and this time they'll make it look like an accident. I have no idea what happened, and I'm not going to look any further into it. That's the thing; I didn't look super nope, deep into anything. Nope, I don't know what happened. We just looked so very sorry. surface level into this, but. Wow. And those are just the facts of the case. But as of now, the death of Charles Morgan remains an open and unfortunately inactive case with the county sheriff's department. And no new leads or suspects have been identified since the early 90s. And I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Isn't that a crazy tale? What a wild, wild case a wild story i feel for his family so hard. not and, having any answers and i feel for ruth she went she lived the rest of her yeah, life not with knowing. all these questions yeah but luckily she was safe for the rest of her life yeah at least and you i'm know, glad like, that his unharmed. daughters were unharmed and jeez but it's a spooky one very spooky and one i will never read any further into nope me either and so with that being said, we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. But that's where that you look any further into this case. Love you so much. Bye.